I spent years waffling about what to do for the end credits of The Pathless. Especially coming from earlier experiences, like especially I was born for this on Journey, it felt maybe a little formulaic to write a song. I thought, I've done this, I've been there. We didn't do that on Abzu, exactly, but I had done it on other projects. Underground and Assassin's Creed Syndicate functioned in much that way. Can't Resist from Monaco. So then the question became, all right, if I'm gonna write a song, what can we do that's gonna feel different from the ones that we've done before and feel somehow earnest and earned by the gameplay experience itself? One of the narrative threads that I had latched onto early in the project was the idea that the hunter doesn't initially know why she's being delivered to this island, why she's been kind of sent there in what to me always felt like a sacrifice. They, her civilization or wherever she comes from, send her there hoping she might oppose the darkness, but they've sent countless hunters for time eternal and with no results to speak of. The darkness had continued to spread in the world. And so it had become almost a form of ritual sacrifice, like throwing a, you know, the young maiden into the volcano, so to speak. And I thought, I like the idea that she manages to do what none had done before her, but not just in actually defeating the darkness, but even in learning what was going on there and even understanding her purpose. In that way, the game, to me, feels very much like a metaphor to just life itself. And so the song needed to reflect all that. The song had to somehow wrap all that together. And the specific idea that I liked the best was that her goal is to basically give her life in full, unhesitant service to others. Once I latched onto that, that felt very powerful. That felt very reasonable as a narrative thread. I thought I could even try my hand at writing the lyrics, which I don't normally do, since they could be kind of proverb-like in nature. You know, for example, the, the, the line of the central chorus, I came to a land which was not my own. I had this very simple musical idea for what would become the kind of chorus of the tune, and it's something that we hint earlier in the game when she first encounters the God Slayer. And it's just a simple little melody. Drawing from the kind of broadly folk-like tradition quality of the rest of the score, it seemed like the melody could be a campfire song, something that maybe generations of people would know. So a very simple melody. After trying a bunch of different things, I landed on this very simple little tune. Okay, so here we are in the session, and if I start with the piano roll, you can see that the idea was to begin with Oyunga singing just the melody on its own, and about halfway through, I bring in some of the uh, initial instruments. The lyrics of this melody uh, are very simply, down this road he calls to me, Yet truth calls from beyond the fog. And then here, just little hints. Keeping it nice and simple. And of course, we have Eric Snoza giving us some bass pizzicato. So just at the, we, we then go into the, of course, uh, first true verse. And to accompany that, a uh, bunch of stuff, mostly very just simple harmonic accompaniment. 
I've got this low organ-like harmachord, uh, which I use a lot for this harmonic support type work. And that's Paul Cartwright on his baritone violin that we came up with for purposes of this score. He essentially invented an instrument that we've just sort of lovingly dubbed the baritone violin. It's basically a, a violin tuned fully an octave down playing really thick strings uh, because I wanted an instrument that felt a little bit more folk-like. So you can see we, we get some really wonderful, nice, rich tones. And then, uh, of course, the nickel harpa, which I use all throughout the score, makes its first appearance straight out of the gate. Very simple little basic counterpoint uh, along with the bass and, and, and just some simple strumming on um, the lute. And so if we take out the vocals, you can see it's actually, it's actually a really simple piece. hopefully rounds it off the verse lyric to begin with is far from the path I found my home below the earth to gaze at you above as you journey beyond the fog again it was it was me writing a text that's supposed to suggest that kind of proverb-esque way of expressing that sometimes off the path in life in the fog in the mystery do we start to uncover truth sort of Robert Frost-like, I guess. I have to say, I really, really loved the way it came together hearing these two primary bowed strings, the baritone violin and the nickel harpa, in tandem with her voice. You know, if I get rid of that, look how much hollower this is. What a difference it makes. So, of course, as we round out the end of this first verse, we get a little hit on that riff again and then the thing that i thought would be interesting is because it's a very folk-like thing to do especially when you are making music in a kind of campfire way where what instruments you're going to have are not even a given uh i i literally double the melody in the baritone violin on the second verse The result is that obviously if I take out the vocals, it still pretty much sounds like the piece. There was something nice about that. There was something about the idea that she's a leader, but that what she's leading fundamentally has the ingredients of everything that's going on. I don't normally write that way. Normally, if I would have a vocal, there'd be no overlapping material with the vocal. It's a sparing gesture. It's obviously one of those things that it has a potential to really conflict with the vocal, especially if their intonation isn't exact. But in this case, I didn't want their intonation to be totally precise. It doesn't sound folk-like as a result. And of course, we've got, you know, plenty of other ingredients in there again as well. The harmachord is still going. 
more uh, hammered dulcimer, and, and, and there's a whole variety. This particular one is the Kim, uh, but there's a bunch of instruments in that vein. Tongue drum, uh, the nickel harp, of course, and then... We've got some a fun little hidden gem going on here that's intentionally very hidden in the mix, which, of course, I've got some of my Alosh ensemble that um, is just adapted from the improv that we did. And then I've actually got Peter Hollins uh, helping flesh out a sort of background choir. And it's something I intentionally really don't want you to consciously hear, but there's something about the unique humming of the human voice that's unlike anything else. So then, underneath this first verse, is where I have a very, very, very hidden first instance of what I referred to as the ghost choir. Now, the ghost choir was this idea that as I was thinking about it and I was almost done writing the song, I had this notion of wouldn't it be nice to have backup vocals that are in a way representative of the prior hunters that have come before her, people she didn't know, and yet each one of them helped make a little bit of progress in the world and leave her little clues. And so she could never really do any of this quest without them, yet they would never meet. They would know nothing of each other. And these other members of the choir, you know, these prior hunters, as it were, they wouldn't ever even know if what they did mattered. So I decided to entrust this choir concept to uh, some friends of mine. I reached out to Troy Baker first, since he was already voicing the character of the God Slayer, and I knew he can sing fantastically. Uh, Darren Korb, who had been there in London when we recorded the orchestral aspect and what we were doing his Supergiant uh, album and, and the Hades recordings. And it's just a dear friend whose voice I love and I thought could be a fun little Easter egg to have him in there. Maluka, fabulous YouTuber that I've worked primarily with on the Banner Saga franchise, but on a bunch of other things as well. Uh, Sematis, the singer who was already featured um, elsewhere in the score after the whole Erica contest thing. Adriana Figueroa, who I had only really worked with circuitously through the uh, You Say Run cover that I participated in with my pal Mason Lieberman. And I, but I had met her at GDC in years past and knew she had a fabulous voice and it was only a matter of time before we worked together. And then, of course, um, my pals uh, from Tripod, Stephen Gates, Simon Hall, and Scott Edgar, um, who I was already working on with for another project and said, you know, you mind just throwing in a recording of this as well? To cap it off, I then really wanted it to feel ghostly, and I tried a bunch of different things, and I was not totally happy with the nature of the production on it. So I have a friend, uh, Joris Hoekstetter, who's a phenomenal uh, musician, composer, you know, music technologist and, and producer, and I reached out and I said, here's a premise. Uh, I'm calling this a ghost choir. Here's how I've tried mixing it. I don't want it to be super washed out and reverb heavy, but I've tried a variety of different types of EQs and I wasn't really happy with it because it's one of those things that I want it to feel like we're hearing it through a wall, but it's not just knocking out the high end or the low end in, in those traditional ways. I really want it to feel like it's it's a ghostly presence. And I had showed him all the different ways that I was experimenting with it and not quite loved. And he took that and ran with it and, and, and helped come up with this sound. <laughs> Which is a very specific uh, cocktail of EQs and very subtle and very short reverbs. And so the result is, when you listen, if you have just the voice and the ghost choir, it sounds like this. I really wanted to feel like that ghost choir was almost an extension of Oyunga's voice. It was this idea that upon this platform of prior hunters and of earlier generations stood our hero finally victorious and represented by this collective of voices. And it took a lot of finesse, but I think it really seemed to come together. Oh. 
coming out of that first verse and having planted the seed of the ghost choir, um, now we finally introduce the orchestra for the first time. Oh. And now our first chorus. As we reach the end of the phrase, we give the uh, little riff from before to the strings and our wonderful group fames, the Macedonia Radio Symphony folks conducted by Oleg Kontradenko in Skopje. They just did such a beautiful job with it. Obviously, little kind of glass marimbas and things like that. Um, in those cases, that was actually done with samples. The majority of this is, of course, not samples, but there were a few little sounds that I, you know, I obviously put little delays on it and things. So it, it reads almost in a way more like a synth. Just to add a little bit of sparkle. After now having gone through a couple of verses in a chorus, this is the first instance where we hear this new rendition of the main theme. And the main theme is, of course, carried by the strings, but um, we blend in a lot of the various soloists as well, since they're such a crucial part of the makeup of the score. <laughs> And Kristen, who had been absent in the song up till this point. The soloist submix would sound something like this. I couldn't resist a great big lush statement from the strings. So on their own, you can hear how uh, they're almost their own piece at this stage. So it all sums together. Something I haven't mentioned much is that the percussion is actually really understated. You know, the, there's a bit of the uh, M.B. Gordy hand percussion kind of material in here. Simple puili sticks and things like that. Uh, percussion is not a major part of this piece. As we proceed into yet another statement of the verse, another little Easter egg shows up, which is that... Um, Joel Finney, who's one of the developers at Giant Squid who worked on the game, plays guitar and, and just reached out one day and said, hey, you think there might be a place I can contribute? So at this uh, big, very lush statement of it, I thought, let's add in a little electric guitar. It's sort of lower than the surface level of the mix so that it's just adding to the richness of the harmonic language. beautiful job playing those harmonics and uh, of course the nickel harpa fully accompanimental as opposed to the baritone violin which is once again very just full-on taking a 
a co-lead on the melody with Oyunga. In fact, when we were recording, I told Paul, pretend there's no vocal. And again, I think it's a kind of an interesting quality that the piece sort of works if I remove the vocal completely. <laughs> never dream of performing it that way. When I add Oyunga back in though, notice having planted the seed of the ghost choir, you can really start to hear them more even though probably your conscious listening didn't pick up on it initially. At least that's my hope. The goal is that it should be very much a subtext. <laughs> In my mind, it's sort of the sonic equivalent of when you look at these old uh, stained glass windows that depict Jesus and other sainted figures, especially in the Catholic tradition, where you would see their head and they have a very distinct shape to the halo that would form around them. It's not like the cartoon halo that's essentially a frisbee directly above their head, but more like a circle of light coming from behind them. I wanted it to feel like the vocal equivalent of that, where you are fully and totally focused on Oyunga, and yet there's clearly something else kind of vying for your attention. And the looseness, the kind of quasi-together sound of it, of a group around a campfire of a group around a campfire, I think really uh, seemed to work. And my, my, I was worried it might not. I was worried it might be a little too conceptually interesting, but, um, you know, rustic in, in execution that just felt like, oh, there's a bunch of singers that didn't really rehearse properly or something like that. But, but especially with Yoris's help on producing it to really kind of make it narrower a tad and, and kind of reel in the voices and make them become a little bit more of a halo and less of this big sprawling background sound. It, it seemed to accomplish this goal of being echoes of past hunters. <laughs> So now we go into that final kind of grand statement of the chorus tune. And here is where after each successive entrance of this ghost choir, they were becoming a little bit more obvious, a little bit more clear. And so I, I make them their least hidden here. Uh, uh. And you can hear I have a lot of range there. Troy Baker sang this thing in three different octaves, and Adriana sang it in two different octaves. You can hear her and uh, Sematis uh, up there absolutely just scorching the soprano range. And I also love that everybody articulated it in their own ways. I intentionally gave them no direction. So you hear, you know, some going, ah, 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 and yet others very differently, no, yeah. And that, all those disparities really seem to highlight. And, 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 and beautifully come together as people that don't know each other and yet united by a common cause. And I, I, I just, I, I was so happy how that resulted because I didn't know if it was going to work. so nice to be able to use the full palette of colors, the strings. All the various little, you know, glassy and marimba-ish mallets. You know, these thick harmonic support in the harmachord.
See, there's a little bit of subtle synth work there. Full on with the dulcimers and things like that. Nickel harpa. Beautiful support from Eric Snoza. Trying to give a bass line that's uh, a little bit more worthy. And of course, Tom Straley. And, and of course, Kristen Nagus. So we end up with this really pretty heavy-handed doubling of the melody. moments where I get to kind of break the accompaniment free and they get to do kind of separate figures. So as we're doing this, you know, da, na, 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 things like the Morgan on the nickel harpa. Slightly more busy and active. And then of course uh, the strings do something uh, entirely on their own as well. Anything that will bring the accompaniment even more to life, so it's never just melody and chords. I always find that so boring. <laughs> if I get rid of the accompaniment and then also get rid of the ghost choir doubling the melody so much, you can really hear that it, it, it again, it's basically a fully fledged piece without the lead line, which normally I would avoid, I'll just say again, but I think kind of works in the context of this more folk-like idiom. And then for our big uh, final version of the main theme and it's and it's kind of resting last state. And here, Oyunga sings a new text that is only heard at this moment. And so even though she's singing that vocal there, I actually wanted this to be the moment where the ghost choir is basically not a ghost anymore. They're just, they're just at the front. And so even though they don't have any text, Oyonga is essentially channeling what they are saying in my mind, which translated from the Mongolian is, we fell for you. Admittedly, I did kind of steal from myself, I think, a little bit from Journey and I Was Born For This because I do end with this overtly kind of positive rendition of that tune. And I did the same where the theme to Journey actually comes in all reharmonized in a much more major key sounding way at the, the one and only time in the game for that last statement of the, of the kind of chorus. And um, with that sort of odd modulation to C major um, as my leaping off point, I let Oyunga 
give us this far thinner, far smaller rendition of that melody and um, harmonized in a far more kind of positive way. So obviously we have the little riff that framed the whole piece, once again, um, with mostly the, uh, the, um, the lute and, and, and um, the dulcimers and things like that. And I wanted to make sure that essentially the last sound that you hear is the Alash Ensemble. Their instruments and their voices. So much of this score is thanks to them and built on their artistry and it seemed like the very last sound you hear definitely needed to be them. So, there you have it, the end credit song, A Land Which Was Not My Own, featuring Oyonga Bold, a wonderful ghost choir, and all the respective soloists of The Pathless. I really, 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 really loved working on this game. I thought Giant Squid was making something really special. I felt very, very lucky that uh, our amazing leader, Matt Nava, was so interested in uh, a, a, an expressive and, and kind of eclectically odd instrumental palette and, um, and with the prominence of these colors like the Tuvan throat singing and, and Oyunga's or um, stylized Mongolian singing and the Swedish nickel harpa and the Chinese bamboo flutes and the Irish penny whistles and on and on and on and on it went. I never felt like I was treading on thin ice with these kinds of choices and that you can't always assume that's going to be the case. And so to call it lucky, to call it something that I'm grateful for um, is a severe understatement. So hopefully that added a little bit of uh, interesting look underneath the hood of how put together the ending credits song. And uh, we'll see you for the next one of these. Thank you so much. <laughs>